Uh, good evening. Uh, I'm Charles Nesson, the faculty director of the Berkman Center, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Valenti versus Lessig debate on the future of intellectual property. This is an issue of truly momentous importance to the university, to all of us faculty and students here, as well as to the nation at large. And it is a remarkable opportunity to have these two great figures in the field face off against each other. I'd like to uh, introduce to you our moderator for this evening, Jonathan Zittrain. Uh, Jonathan is a graduate of Yale College, of uh, Harvard Law School and the Kennedy School. He was the executive director of the Berkman Center and a co-founder of the Berkman Center uh, for a number of years before joining the Harvard Law School faculty as an assistant professor. He leads a class here in Internet and Society in which the issue of this debate as well as other key issues of cyber law are the subject of the class. So would you join me in welcoming Jonathan Zittrain as our moderator and host. Good evening. Uh, we have an interesting uh, discussion planned for this evening and a few technical accompaniments that I figure we might as well try to explain up front uh, before we actually start talking. So uh, one technical accompaniment is this, which is what is going out to the world at large, apparently slightly delayed because Charlie just left. <laughs> It's live. I guess it's kind of a Howard Stern 30-second delay thing. Uh, so up here we have uh, the discussion that we're already having had. God, this is Einsteinian and its implication. And uh, up here you see a chat room in which people say they can't understand a thing that's going on here. And uh, over along the left you have a number of the people that are in that chat room and along the right some helpful uh, links. So if you're tuned in out there, if this ever reaches you, hello, we're glad to have you. Um, and also uh, in the back of the room, seated at a table that I can't see, so I don't know if you can either, uh, but just in front of Andrew McLaughlin and Eric Seltzman there are a number of people that are moderating the chat rooms. And they, they in turn, yeah, wave your hands everybody, there you go, the chat room moderators. Uh, so if you have wireless ethernet here, uh, yeah, thank you. So, their goal is principally to keep people occupied in the event the webcast doesn't work, but also to shape discussions uh, as the event unfolds. Uh, also, we've opened a number of windows because we know it's somewhat warm in real space here. Uh, feel free to open a few others around the perimeter if they don't do the job. Uh, so uh, we thought we would open, we'll ha introduce our two guests, they're going to have some sort of opening thoughts, and then as quickly as possible we'll actually move it out to the floor, both the real floor and the virtual floor. There's a microphone here and we'll give a signal uh, when uh, we can start queuing up at that microphone, and uh, also a chance to submit remote questions uh, from the cyberspace panel if you're out there on the web somewhere. Uh, so with that, why don't we bring out our two uh, principals, uh, Professor Larry Lessig and Mr. Jack Valenti, come on down. You're the next contestant. Uh, how to introduce such colorful and interesting characters? Um, the moderator's punt is usually to ask them to introduce themselves. Uh, Jack, why don't you tell us about yourself? <laughs> Thank you, Jonathan, for that wonderful introduction. Yes, right. <laughs> About as brief as you can get, I might add. Uh, Mr. Lehrer, God bless you, and all of you here tonight. I'm not going too fast, because, yes, I am. I am looking out at this audience of Harvard Law School students, the best and the brightest, pick of the litter, best of breed. And I'm reminded of what Adlai Stevenson said when he spoke to the United States Chamber of Commerce, all the big moguls were their businessmen. And he began his speech with the following, which I offer to you. He said, I'm so glad today to see so many of my friends 
and so few of my supporters. <laughs> I have uh, been through a, a rather tumultuous two weeks where the movie industry and I in particular have been lacerated uh, by a number of senators, some of them on the Senate Commerce Committee. And I thought about when I worked in the White House that whenever LBJ confronted one of these uh, moments when he was being compared unfavorably with Caligula, that he, uh, <laughs> that he would say, okay boys, it's getting hot out there. We're gonna all hunker down like a jackass in a hailstorm and wait for the wind to stop blowing. That's the way I'm feeling uh, about the Senate Commerce Committee and the Congress, and now I'm at the Harvard Law School, <laughs> where Larry Lessig is going to demolish me and shred me up pretty good. I, somewhere, in, I, somewhere I know I'm just a simple country boy introduction. <laughs> oh, you've heard this speech before. Okay. <laughs> In this uh, paper in the back here, uh, I don't know what the professor said, but I took uh, umbrage at it, and in a moment of uh, peak, I made some awkward and uh, unwholesome remarks. <laughs> and I did not apply what I call the variety test in the movie business. The variety test is never write a letter or any internal private memo to anybody that you couldn't see on the front page of Variety. Well, that didn't pass the Variety test. I think this whole issue is very simple. And to my untutored legal mind, I'm now about to utter something that will cause a great consternation. I'm not a lawyer. Though in full disclosure, I always wanted to be one. Truly so. And I always wanted to go to the Harvard Law School. But some, <laughs> somehow or another that got mixed up because uh, uh, I was going to school at night and I was working during the daytime in an advertising department of a company and I began to rise and at a very young age I was the number two guy in the advertising department so I said well if I'm not going to go to the Harvard Law School I'll do the third best thing. I'll go to the Harvard Business School. So that's what I did. And if I seem arrogant and unreasonable today, that's what they taught me while I was there. <laughs> I think this is very simple. And sometimes uh, we try to make things unsimple. In my readings, I remember reading the words of a monk in the 14th century. I know all of you are quite aware of uh, William of Ockham. His, sayings come trippingly to your tongue, I'm sure, quickly. But he uttered something called Occam's Razor. And if any of you took philosophy at Harvard College, uh, he comes up. In essence, what Occam was saying in Occam's Razor is, never multiply except out of absolute necessity, meaning keep the bloody thing simple. This is very simple. This is about private property, intellectual property, that because of this technological leisure domain called the internet, which I think is going to be the greatest thing that ever happened to the movie business, people find it easy to steal. Now that's a harsh and unforgiving word, and it's full of serrated edges. But I quote, and I hope I'm quoting correctly, Larry, and you can check me out, Judge Kaplan, federal judge Kaplan in the, the DCSS case had his, one of the last paragraph in his decision said that in the excitement of having so readily available this avalanche of information blurs people's minds to the fact that when you take what is not yours and which is not freely offered to you it is stealing, unquote. I spoke in April to the best and the brightest at Stanford University, where Professor Lessig will be enlightening their minds as he has yours. And uh, about 200 young students 
and they really were bright. And I was told that one young man was going to graduate summa cum laude, and so I addressed him, attractive young man, and I said, You're supposed to be at the top of your class. Now you know, well first, let me back up. I asked how many of you at Stanford have bought a music album in the last four months? Nobody's hand went up. How many of you were on Napster? And nine out of 10 hands went up. So I said to this young man, now you know you're stealing because you're too smart not to know that. How do you gauge this within your own moral ethic? And for a moment, he was silent, and then he said, yeah, I guess you might say it is stealing, but by the way, everybody else in Stanford's doing it, and besides, these music albums cost too much. And I left with one of the high-ranking officials of Stanford. I said, I am, I find this a most lamentable evening. I said, you know what you're doing at Stanford? You're teaching the next generation of our leaders that it's okay to take what isn't yours, you know it isn't yours, and you're using it without the owner's permission. What kind of moral platform will spring this young man in his later life, if that's what we're doing? And God knows how many 10 to 12 or 13 year olds doing the same thing. Now, I think Professor Lessig could lay down a whole platform, a whole rostrum, of reasons why this is okay to do. But as the judge says, Judge Kaplan, just because something is on the internet does not mean that it's free. And this is what the internet is breeding in a lot of people. Now I will tell you now, by the way, I don't know how long I'm supposed to speak. I figure if I go long enough, Night, will, I mean, dawn will come and Lessig won't have a rebuttal. I mean, that'd be one way to handle it. <laughs> Let me just finish up with what we are doing, because you might say, well, listen, you guys are old dinosaurs out in Hollywood, greedy, and you got your swimming pools and everybody makes 10 zillion dollars a year, and uh, what do you care? In March, I decided to organize within the Motion Picture Association which is, by the way, an assembly of the seven largest producers in the world of movies, television, and home video. And I might add, the American movie dominates the world. We are hospitably received by every country throughout on this racked and weary planet because people really find the kind of stories we tell on film irresistible. Having said that, I now I'm organizing a new digital strategy department Within two weeks, we're, I'm zeroing in on a young man to head up this department. I've talked with the smartest people in cyberspace all over this country. I sit on the board of two internet companies where my fellow board members are range in age from 23 to 30. And I am I'm learning a whole new patois, a whole new language. And I'm learning a lot. I'm learning from these young people about this ordinary breakthrough next to Gutenberg's invention of movable type and television, this is the third greatest entry into the human society up to now. That is my frail opinion, it may not be yours. And we're going to organize, the, out of digital strategies, a system, a procedure, where our member companies will be online, I hope within a year, offering movies under some business model, each movie company will construct its own business model, offering movies in some form at other, I mean some business model, some business form, at fair, reasonable, and sensible prices. So that there is, there will be an alternative to stealing, that you can bring down movies, particularly if you have broadband access. Most people today have a 56K modem, like I do, it would take you nine or 10 hours to bring down a movie. So we have this small window of opportunity before the sky crashes in on us. And I believe that when we do that, we will offer the alternative because a lot of people say, well, the reason why people steal is there's no other way for us on the internet to bring this down. So I'm just telling you now that plans are in the works to deal with content encryption, 
to deal with watermarking, to deal with digital rights management, and all the processes that will allow us to negotiate with the manufacturers of devices as well as the manufacturers of computers so that our digital rights management instructions will be listened to and responded to by the television sets, the set-top boxes, the computer, or the recording device, whichever a person may have in their living room. So I come back to tell you, it's very simple. When you take, as the judge said, when you take down from the internet something that does not belong to you, is not freely offered to you, Judge Kaplan says the only word for that is stealing. Now the sermon next week, we'll, we'll go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Lessig. Well, when Jonathan asked me to do this, uh, I thought this was going to be hard. Jack Valenti is an extraordinarily articulate and powerful person advocating the views which he has been advocating quite successfully since he took over the Motion Pictures Association in 1966. And then I had a chance to meet him tonight uh, for the first time that we ever had a chance to really talk. And it turned out, in addition to being articulate and powerful, he's also about the sweetest guy you could ever know. And so I can't help but look like a villain as I uh, pound him, right, as in his description. <laughs> <laughs> but I've kind of made it a career to have people hate me, and so, Jack, though I really admire and uh, respect you, I'm afraid I'm going to uh, make you hate me here. That's my job. Um, but I want to start with this idea of it's a simple point, and I want to confess that I think that lawyers have created the problem that makes this seem like a simple point. Because the word that titles this debate, uh, future of intellectual property, builds inside it a basic confusion about what we're talking about. The word property, which Jack uh, introduced by saying, this is a debate about the right to steal private property. Now, if you look in the Constitution of the United States, you don't see the word intellectual property. In fact, if you were living back then, I know I wasn't, and Jack neither was there then, I don't believe, but. <laughs> uh, they didn't use the word intellectual property. In fact, they didn't even have the concept of intellectual property. What they spoke about was government-backed monopolies over the right to speak and the right to deploy certain ideas. And the framers of our Constitution were extraordinarily skeptical about granting the power to Congress to create monopolies over the right to speak and the right to deploy ideas. Jefferson was a strong opponent of the idea with respect to patents, thought it was too dangerous that this would create intrigue in Washington where people would simply be gathering to buy off Congress to extend their monopoly rights. Smart guy, Jefferson was. <laughs> and in Pennsylvania, before they adopted the Constitution, they said, we will not adopt the Constitution until there's a First Amendment to guarantee that the power to control speech built into the Copyright Clause uh, does not mean the power to control the distribution and development of culture, right? Now, when the framers finally got down to legislating about copyright, which is, I think, the real area that uh, Jack and I have some uh, disagreement here, they passed a law that said an author has the right to uh, control, an exclusive right to control the printing of maps, charts, and books for 14 years as an initial term. That did not include the right to control the performance of that work, to create a poem that tracks the work, derivative works, uh, to do a translation of the work, to do an abridgment of the work. It didn't include any of those rights. It only targeted the behavior of taking other people's writings and copying it through publishing and distributing it in a way which was stealing from a market. In 1790, there were 127 publishers in the United States. 
And so this law was regulating 127 entities in the United States to stop them from competing with this narrow field of maps, charts, and books. For the first 100 years of our country, it extended this right only to Americans. Our contempt for China notwithstanding, we should not forget the fact that we were born as a pirate nation. Now this vision of a narrow power vested in Congress to create a limited incentive for authors to produce and afterwards for their production to fall into the public domain, which is the only constitutional requirement, the terms be limited and that uh, after that uh, term expires it falls into the public domain. This limited power has expanded dramatically over the past 200 years. Now copyright extends not just to maps, charts, and books, but to any, quote, writing and uh, architecture is writing, which is uh, expressed in a tangible form. It includes uh, this set of rights will extend for the life of the author plus 70 years so that um, Irving Berlin's greatest work got protected for 140 years. 10 times the initial term that the framers established. It covers not just the right to control publishing and sale of the original work, it controls the rights to do performances, it controls the rights to do derivative works, to do translations, to display it. Not just that work, but any derivative work. So if you take, uh, see a television show and you want to make a summary of it that you put on the World Wide Web, you are violating the terms of copyright. Now, until the internet, who cared, right? Because publishing and creativity was the sort of stuff that was done by large organizations, which Jack very ably represents. Who really cared that you couldn't be a publisher when the cost of being a publisher was high? But on the creation of the internet, when the internet was created, it's no longer the large organizations who can be part of the creative process, it's everybody. And this law, which is originally directed 127 people, now regulates all of us. All of us, in every single action that we do in the context of the internet, is regulated by copyright law. Now the question, in my mind, is not a question, the simple question, and I'm a law professor, so I can't help but making everything complex. I'm sorry for that. It's not the simple question of stealing or not. It's the question of how far this set of monopoly rights will be allowed to extend. And this has been turned into an extraordinarily hard problem because of the emergence of the technologies that Jack was describing at the end of his uh, introduction. Because most of the copyright industry and most legislators look at the internet as, it's t as it is today and they say to themselves, this is a disaster. People can easily copy, they can easily steal, they can send a thousand copies of the same CD to everybody they possibly know, and there's no ability to control it, and we've got to act now or it will be the death of the industry. This is a cheap shot, Jack, I'm sorry. The last time you worried about the death of the industry, of course, was with the VCR, which too was a uh, technology that facilitated theft, it was stealing, it would be the death of the industry. In fact, the Boston Strangler, I think you called the VCR, um, in testimony to Congress. So here's the death of the industry, it's gonna be created by this technology that facilitates stealing. And I don't wanna deny that there's lots of what should be appropriately called stealing going on. I don't think the, I think the better word for us to worry about is pirating, but let's think about stealing, that's fine. But the future is not today or the internet as it was five years ago. The future is the set of technologies that Jack described for making it possible to control the distribution of intellectual property through code, through technologies that will give intellectual property holders more rights than this exploded, bloated copyright law itself does. For example, take the law that you think associates with a book. You buy a book, and the ordinary assumption you have about this book is you can give it to a friend, you can loan it to a friend to use, you can sell it to somebody else, you can take a chapter, you can copy it out, you can criticize, you can have a book club 
where people read the book out loud to each other, make fun of it, criticize it. You could have your own little fan club for this particular book. You can do all of this in real space, in part because the law gives you this right, the first sale doctrine allows you to sell it, um, the fair use doctrine allows many of the uses that I'm describing, and just the high cost of policing how people use these works makes it impossible for copyright holders actually to exercise any control over use. But the future is not that picture of the book that you have in real space. The future for intellectual property is the picture of the DVD and the controls built into the DVD plus the copyright controls that Jack described. So the DVD or the technologies for distributing electronic content include within them a whole set of rights determined not by the law, but by the seller of the property. Do you have a right to loan it to somebody else for them to use it? No, no right. Do you have a right to sell it? No, no right. Do you have a right to copy a part of it for your own use? Only if they give it to you. Do you have a right to criticize it? Well, you actually might waive that right in a contract. Do you have a right to use it in ways that they don't want you to use it? That's the issue. The question for copyright in the future is whether copyright will give copyright holders the power to control the use of copyrighted material. Now, the Supreme Court has steadfastly asserted that copyright was never designed, here's a quote from the Sony case, it's never been designed to accord the copyright holder complete control over all possible uses of his work. And yet, through the technologies that are being developed and deployed right now, and they are being litigated about in the DCSS case, in the CP hack case, um, uh, and in the Napster case, and in the my.mp3.com case, these technologies are being deployed and litigated about in a way which will establish the right of Hollywood to control how you use their material. And this is the question we have to struggle with. Our constitutional tradition is not about giving copyright holders the power to control use. It's about guaranteeing a fair return from what they've produced and assuring that it moves into the public domain, into a place where people can take the property, as you would describe it, and use it without the permission of anyone. So for example, Alice in Wonderland, Beauty and the Beast, Cinderella, Fantasia, Hercules, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, The Little Mermaid, Pinocchio, Pocahontas, works produced by Walt Disney Corporation, taking stories that existed in the public domain, never having to get the permission or authorization of anybody before they produce that new work. That is the concept the framers gave us of a rich public domain that all of us, now empowered by an internet that enables all of us to be producers, can draw upon and develop and create through content which is not controlled by any one organization, whether governments or the West Coast powers. Right? So I'm not going to defend, and I'm sorry to some of you want me to defend. I can't defend quote, stealing of content. But if we write our laws focused on the state of technology it is, as it is today, if we give content providers absolute power to write their code to control use however they want, and we uphold those laws today, which is what is happening in the DCSS case, then in five years, a technology will exist, and it's being deployed right now, and it was invoked by Jack right now, that will give Hollywood much more control over the use and distribution of, co of, of intellectual, quote, property in cyberspace than they ever had over the control of content in real space. And that change is the change I think we have to resist. Thank you. Uh, before we open it up, why don't I... Well, let me just, I'd yeah, like to do a, a tiny little rebuttal here, but first, I want to ask Professor Lessig a question. Whenever, when I worked in the White House and 
president gathered his aides around and we would all rise and testify. After about an hour, he'd say, okay, enough of this, therefore, which means, what's your conclusion? I'm trying to figure out, Larry, what are you proposing about copyright? And as you might tell one of your students, give it to me in a paragraph. Okay. <laughs> Given a law professor's paragraph, that'll be very easy, actually. <laughs> Uh, I'm proposing first that we go back to a conception of a term which is reasonable. I say 14 years as a first move. We can compromise about how long you want that to be. Second, we no longer permit retroactive extensions of the term of copyright. Sitting in the front row is Eric Eldred, who's a lead plaintiff in a case, Eldred versus Reno, which is challenging uh, what's known to some of its fans as the Mickey Mouse Protection Act case, which is the Copyright Term Extension Act case, which uh, extends the term of copyright by 20 years. Uh, that practice should end. And third, the ability of people to take and use copyrighted material consistent with the underlying copyrighted copyright law, consistent with fair use, has got to be guaranteed. And so, for example, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which has something called the anti-circumvention provision built into it, which says you cannot circumvent or build tools to circumvent copyright protection schemes, even if the underlying use would have been protected by fair use. You just can't undo it. Uh, that's, uh, uh, that's built into this law. That, too, seems to me to be beyond the, sc be beyond the scope of what copyright ought to be protecting. And finally, we should have built into the process of articulating these laws a stronger conception of the importance of the public domain in facilitating the creative process. This is not about left versus right. This is about understanding how the creative process works. And it works by having many innovators, not just a few, who can draw upon dis dispersed resources not just the resources granted to them by permission of a licensing department um, at MGM, uh, that they can use and build into other material that other people can use. That's the model of our framers, and I think we should get back to that model. All right, let me say briefly, maybe not so briefly, but uh, Larry is one of the most charming and enchanting people ever to, to shove a lance dipped in Karari right up my backside, so I... <laughs> At least he's charming about it. <laughs> but since you brought up history, uh, going back to Thomas Jefferson, let me recite some history for you. I hope my memory here is relevant. Goes back, I'm sure that many of you read the Critique of Pure Reason. Immanuel Kant once wrote something, no, not near as famous. It's called The Injustice of Pirating Books. Old Manny Kant did that a long time ago in which he said it is the moral right of an author to be able to profit from his works. And Samuel Johnson once said that everybody writes for money except a blockhead. I might add that in the French Revolution of 1789, the revolutionaries abolished copyright because they used some of the logic of, of Professor Lessig, not all of it, but some of it, and said it's not fair to the people Everyone should reap the benefits of whatever creative work was out there. In Paris, within a year, 20% of the publishing houses went bankrupt. The kind of creative works fell off. The gossip sheets flourished. And three years later, France brought back the Copyright Act. Now, this is part of the historical things. All I'm saying to you, let me tell you something about the movie business. What is developed in the internet is the possibility of on the premiere of a picture that's opening New York or Boston or wherever, somebody goes in with a sophisticated camcorder, takes a copy of it, throws it up on the internet, and one billion people within 186,000 miles per second has it. And then they could bring it down on broadband hooked up to their television set with a great fidelity to sight, sound, and color. On the premiere, 
The average movie of a major studio today costs $52 million. $52 million. You cannot, only two pictures out of ten ever regain their investment back from exhibition in theaters. They have to go to a sequential marketplace, not only here but around the world. And one of the reasons, Professor Lessig, as you well may know, why the Copyright Act was extended is to put it in rapport with the European Copyright Act. Because if we go to 14 years or 10 years, very fine, but this is a world arena now. As, as the Internet points out, this isn't a little insular country called the United States. Then all the Americans' creative works would go into the in public domain instantly, and then the Europeans would use that, and they would make money out of it in Europe off of our creative works because their copyright period is longer, and they're protected. In this global society, you cannot look at things through the reverse end of a telescope. And I'm spending an increasing amount of my time working with people in Europe on their copyright directive to make sure that they do not leap beyond us and confiscate our property over there. I'm always amused, though, by people who want to limit domain. Now, Professor Lessig's new book is coming out by Random House next year. Basic Books put out a, uh, one of his volumes, in, I think, two years ago. And uh, he didn't send me a copy, so I'm going to pay him the highest compliment I can pay an author. I'm going to buy his book at full retail price. I can't do any better than that. <coughs> but like Immanuel Kant and like Dr. Johnson, I think Professor Lessig would be a touch upset if suddenly his book was stolen and the Stephen King uh, electronic books is far more sophisticated when his book comes out. He wouldn't like that. Esther Dyson, who is the great doyen of, of, uh, of the Internet world, and she is even ahead of Professor Lessig. I mean, she just think, doesn't think anybody's copyright ought to be honored. However, she puts out a newsletter, which she charges $750 a year. And guess what? It is only delivered through the U.S. mail. And at the bottom it says, any copy is unauthorized without permission from the author. As we say in politics, it all depends on whose ox is getting gored. All I'm saying to you is this. If you shrink copyright, who is going to make the vast investments in the movie business? I'm not talking about music or anything else. I'm talking about the arena about which I am more than slightly knowledgeable. Who's going to make these huge investments? If you can't move your picture from theaters to Blockbuster, to the internet, uh, to premium pay cable, to pay-per-view, then to free television, and then to foreign countries. If you can't do that, you're out of business. Now, that's the way of the world. I didn't make these rules up. Now, you can say, well, hell, why do you, don't spend $52 million on a picture, okay? But if you're talented and you have the capacity to put butts in a theater seat, your agent's going to command that kind of money. Why do you think we pay basketball players and baseball players and football players untold millions? Not because they're charming and sweet, but because they can advance the ball or they can make the points. They draw people. And that's why you get this money. And if you're a talented lawyer, damn it, you ought to be able to command the highest compensation that your gifts bestow on you. So I'm just saying to you, let's keep it simple. For every, I'm a great believer in the Newtonian laws, that for every action there is a reaction. And if we want to look at history, you can find out what happens when people begin to torment copyright. And I just believe that if you cannot protect what you own, you don't own anything. Now that's a precept that no one is going to repeal in the Congress or in the courts or any place. That's a marketplace fact. So I'd be delighted to open it up at any time. So I, I still share a sense that the bait hasn't fully been met yet, that there's still mm -hmm. sort of ships passing in the night. Before we open it up, I just want to give Larry an opportunity. Is there a single question you'd like to ask Jack and give him his paragraph's length reply uh, <laughs> opportunity? Well, so you're right, Jack. There is a conception of copyright that comes from Europe. Europeans have a much 
uh, different. There's an argument about how different, but I think much different conception about the natural rights that an author has to copyrighted works. That conception eliminates the possibility of work for hire, so studios couldn't own films, only directors can own films. Um, but that conception was rejected by our framers. It is not our conception of copyright law. Our conception of copyright law from the very beginning, as ratified by the framers and then upheld in a court, a case called Wheaton, was that copyright understood to be government-granted monopolies is just about how much incentive we have to give so that people produce creative works. Now you say Hollywood needs lots of incentives. That's fine. And if we could have, let's have a useful argument about how long the term has got to be so that you can make back enough to make films. But when you extend the term retrospectively for work that already exists, the one thing we know about incentives is you can't incent a dead person. Uh, no matter what we do, Hawthorne will not produce any more works. We can give him all the money in the world. Um, and this is the kind of mentality that says Hawthorne should get more money because it's his property or his estate's property or it's a natural moral right that they control this forever that I think is not our tradition. And our tradition is the kind of good debate that we could have about how much is incentive is needed. And not just incentive for Hollywood to do things, but a structure of prop, uh, intellectual property, quote unquote, and an intellectual commons that allows everybody to participate in a creative process, which is the tradition that produced the great uh, culture that America has seen. So, you know, Europe is wonderful. I've lived there for a year. It's the last year I'll live in Europe. Um, What's the um, question? The question is, is it, the, is it against our tradition, you're arguing, or for our tradition? Are our framers pirates, as you, as you want to call everybody who takes without using, because they didn't protect copyright as maximally as you were? Or did they have a different conception of copyright? And if it's a different one, can you explain their conception? Not in a way that makes them see like thieves, but as you eloquently started this by saying you try to understand what somebody means. What did the framers mean when they were so restrictive about how much protection they grant and so limited about how much monopoly power they create? Why did they do such a thing? Well, I, I can answer the question by, in conclave assembled, the Congress of the United States decided to extend copyright protection. And, and, the, and the overriding reason why they did, as I said earlier, was to have those laws in America in rapport with the laws in Europe. But and Europe doesn't pass our laws, Jack. But they I mean, do. Europe, they do? The well, this is have, something I haven't learned yet. Europe, Europe controls our laws. Well, I don't know many things, Professor Lessig, and I'd probably flunk every test you gave me. But on this issue, I'll go to the mat with you. Trust me, they do. The copyright laws in Europe are now at the same level, same span of time as the copyright laws in America. And that's, that's a fact. Now, the only reason I'm saying this is it's because the Congress passed the law. And it, that is the law. Now, if you want to change the law, then call up Senator Kennedy and, and uh, Senator Kerry and start it off. No, but the question is, is extending copyright retrospectively in a way that creates no new incentives and just increases the monopoly returns of existing copyright holders consistent with our tradition, consistent with a copyright clause that says the purpose is not to create uh, monopoly rights, the purpose is to promote progress. And in order to promote progress, Congress can create exclusive rights for a, quote, limited times. And the question is, does this law of Congress, in your view, comply with the vision the framers had or the text that they wrote, or the tradition that we had for the last 140 years? I will answer your question. Yes. It does. Yes, I think it does. Okay, it, but you see, when you answer a question, you have to then give the reasons, so. <laughs> I answer it compactly. Now, the question I want to ask is, though no, I'm- No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm still trying to find out where we are here, because I think Johnson got a point going by. You want to limit 
copyright to 14 years, I think you said. Is that correct? Well, I'm willing to give you this. Let's have a discussion of how long is needed in, the, in order to create incentives. But I know retrospective extensions does nothing for incentives. Do you agree with me on that? Well, that's an issue on which very intelligent men can differ. None that I've met. <laughs> well, you sound like some congressmen I know who believe that they and they alone speak to God every morning on a gold sprint card, and then they're able to tell other people how to deal with the art of making motion no, pictures. I want you to explain well, we to me how it's nice. possible. Uh, it's just, yeah. I, I just, I'm, just I'm explain sorry. to me how it's I possible. I embrace you manfully, but I disagree with you. Okay, but explain it. Give reasons, not just, I mean, I know, you know, Washington isn't a place where people give reasons, they give dollars. So this is not something that happens in Washington much, but we're in Cambridge now. And in Cambridge, <laughs> In Cambridge, you've got to give, you've got to uh, give reasons you, for your argument. There What's is, the reason? There's some toxic molecule here in the Harvard Law School that seems to give people this great vision that ordinary folks, humble folks like me, just don't have. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we can continue to debate this. I just disagree with you. I think what we have now is something special. Now, let me give you some other numbers. I like to deal in facts. I'm more comfortable with them because they can't be rebutted. Intellectual, <laughs> intellectual, intellectual property consists of computer software, music, books, television, home video, and movies. This is the family called intellectual property. It is an arena in which the United States is supreme in the world. And not because I stand on the Champs-Élysées with a bayonet in my hand, forcing people into the Gaumont Theater to see an American movie, or making everybody in France or Belgium or Italy or Brazil watch American programs on television. People make these choices on their own in each country. Now, here's the fact. Intellectual property is America's greatest trade export, bringing back to the American economy more revenues than automobiles and auto parts, than aircraft, then agriculture, back into the American economy. At a time when we're bleeding from trade deficits, and if you see the last month's trade deficit, it went to a ballooning figure that ought to make everybody cry in shame, intellectual property has a surplus balance of trade with every country in the world with whom we do business, over 170 of them. Surplus balance of trade. That's a direct benefit to the American economy. And it shows that America's creativity, resident and living under the canopy of current copyright laws, is doing something that's worthy of the support of this country. And I try to rebut You're not that. calling me now. I'm, I'm, I'm let you rebut that one. Now, okay, so Jack, you're not calling me um, anti-American here, are you? I mean. <laughs> And I love American films like The Next Guy, and again, I'm agreeing with you, we ought to have a structure so that there's a sufficient incentive for people to produce. Nobody's arguing about that. But you wouldn't argue, would you, that just because we make a lot of money in foreign trade, the Constitution should be violated. You wouldn't be making that argument, right? No, but I, I will answer by saying no, that my question to you is, more to the point, do you believe that it's perfectly okay for people on the internet today to bring down music and movies later, free of charge. Do you believe that's okay? In some cases, sure. And so do you. Well, tell me, no, I don't believe it's okay ah. in some cases, sure. <laughs> See, that's right. See, the whole issue... If I offer it to you, and I make it available to you, then it's okay. But I'm asking you again, tell me why it's okay, if I may use that non-legal word, for people, for people to bring down Let's say music, off of Napster. Let's just take that direct, specific case. Do you believe it's okay for people at, at Harvard or Stanford to use the university internet uh, network to be able to bring this down from, from Napster today? Do you think it's okay? If this is understood the way the American Home Audio Act describes private, sharing of content, then by law it's okay. 
And we have to wait to the Ninth Circuit gets to answer this question uh, to see whether, in fact, existing law defines it as okay or not. But whether some people, even if that's not the interpretation, some people are violating the law or not, should, that fact should not determine whether a certain technology is permitted in the marketplace. Now, I know you were very involved in the last time the Supreme Court addressed this question in the VCR case. 1983. Yes. And the claim in the VCR case was, this is a technology designed to, quote, steal. Why else would you have a record button that made it possible to record stuff that came across the television set? There you were taking stuff down, not paying anybody or getting any permission for it. And you were stealing content. That was the argument of the uh, copyright uh, interests. And the Supreme Court said, the question is not whether some people use this to steal or not. The question is, is there a potential for a substantial non-infringing use using this technology? Now, whether you think lots of people are stealing on Napster or not, I don't think anybody believes that there isn't the potential for a substantial non-infringing use on Napster. In particular, if copyright interests were more interested in facilitating the protection of their content in Napster, but the real game that's going on now, rather than facilitating copyright control within Napster's technology by tagging the material, and then under existing law, it would be illegal for Napster to facilitate the trading of tagged copyrighted material. Rather than they do, doing that, the recording industry is more interested in shutting down a channel of distribution they can't control. That's what this debate's about. Because when Napster shut down and when uh, 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 Scour is shut down, then magically we'll see lots of uh, technologies out there for distributing content using the very same technology, but they happen to be all licensed and controlled by the top five record industry uh, that happens now to distribute 90% of records in the world. This is about re-establishing control over distribution, and I don't know what interest the law has in making sure that this five-man uh, oligopoly continue to control distribution of music. What is the legitimate interest consistent with the Constitution? For well, that? let me, I'm now going to commit a crime. I'm going to practice law without a license. David Boyce, who's a lawyer for Napster, is using your same arguments, and we'll see if the Ninth Circuit buys it. And that is this. I know exactly what the Supreme Court said, and I might add that Justice Blackman, uh, Marshall Powell, and uh, Rehnquist were in the four dissenting. It was a five to four decision. What Sony Beta? You don't question that, do you? No, but three of them are gone now. Well, we all leave sometime sooner or later. <laughs> I'm reminded of what Dr. Kissinger once said. If I die... <laughs> this is he what Sony Betamax, and I, all of you should go and look at this. Sony Betamax says that because the VCR had substantial non-infringing uses, that if you time-shifted Time shifted was what they used in, in their decision that was written by Justice Blackman, uh, uh, Justice Stevens, John Paul Stevens, in which he said the VCR, you could time shift, and that is you could tape a program at 7 o'clock when you weren't home and then watch it at 10. What the court did not rule on was whether or not you could take that VCR program and ship it to 10 million people all over the country. It did not say that anything other than over-the-air television, it was okay to time shift. There's a lot of omissions in that lawsuit. And those who bring up Sony Betamax, I urge you to read that case again in detail and with vivid recall of everything that it said. That's number one. Number but, two, but in Napster, let me, let me finish, Professor if I may, and then I will, I will hug you warmly and affectionately. <laughs> and that is this. Napster is totally different. You're not time shifting. You're sharing your files with two million of your best friends. 
anonymous people. You don't know who the hell they are. I mean, there's a thing called boggling the mind, and that really does it. And you don't have to be a Harvard Law School graduate to understand those practical aspects. Okay, let's take a case directly on point then. Record TV. Record TV is a technology where you can sign up to their website. Of course, it's been shut down now by the threat of a $10 million lawsuit. But before the lawsuit, you could go up to their website and you could pick a television show that you wanted to be, quote, taped. It was a virtual VCR. And after you picked that and they taped it, then you later on could watch that content. Now, this is directly analogous, I think you'd say, to the VCR case, isn't it? Well, I'm only going by what uh, Judge Patel said in Napster, and uh, it was a pretty decisive piece of prose, I thought. Not unambiguous at all, plain, precise, and clean. And she made it very clear that what Napster people were doing was illegal. Record TV, not I'll Napster. The case of Record TV. You've, you've been involved in the lawsuit for Record TV, right? Not to my knowledge. <clears throat> At least your press agents uh, report you to be involved in the lawsuit for <laughs> TV. Those damn lawyers are spending money again without me knowing about it. Uh, well, Record TV is a case where the uh, industry has bought a lawsuit for this technology, picking a show to be uh, taped, and then you stream it across the Internet to your computer. Now, let's just assume I, my description of the facts are correct. Um, are we going to hug now? Is that what you're coming over? <laughs> I'm, in, I'm doing what Rick Lazio did. I'm invading his space. <laughs> Can I get you to sign the non-soft money uh, agreement? <laughs> Record TV is directly analogous. Do you think people should be allowed to develop these innovative technologies that permit people to get access to content that they legitimately would have access to without getting the permission of the record or Hollywood. The industry. operative word in which you just said is legitimately. The answer is yes. Anybody can bring down anything that is legitimate to do so. So I agree with you. Okay, so then the reports of your opposition to Record TV are um, premature. I, I'm, you know, you're, you're asking me about something that I'm, I'm barren of knowledge. I just don't know what you're talking about. Okay. So, let's take another case that you are familiar with. My.mp3.com. Okay, what did my.mp3.com do? You had a CD that you possessed, you put it into your computer. The computer then identified the CD to mp3.com. mp3.com then gave you access to that music wherever you were. So if you're at your office, you could listen to the music. If you're at home, you could listen to the music. If you got streaming technology uh, or wireless technology, you could listen to it in your car. So these are three, uh, these are many ways to get access to music that you presumptively own. It's a way of space shifting access to music as opposed to time shifting access to music. It was a creative, innovative way to make people use the internet so that they could get access to their music. Now this practice was shut down by another district court in California. A punitive $110 million judgment was issued against them mm -hmm. for willful violation. But if you agree with the VCR decision, do you, disagree, do you agree with the decision shutting down time shift, space shifting as well as time shifting? I agree with the court. And they said, Why? Well, I do. I mean, I, Reasons, I'm a great believer but... in the judicial system of the United <laughs> States. <laughs> And, you know, it's uh, they, like in the Congress, they say, when you don't have the votes, talk. When you have the votes, vote. So I'm saying to you that the courts are voting. In every case so far, the courts have said that all the things that Larry has cited here are illegitimate. Now, if the courts overturn that, then I'm still a believer in the judicial system of the United States. But right now, the copyright laws or intact, they're, they're knitted and braced against a lot of people who want to change them. So I'm saying, let the courts decide this. Meanwhile, as I told you earlier, we're not waiting for all these court decisions. We're going online, and we're going to present an alternative to stealing. 
And I hope that prices and under a methodology, business model, that most Americans will find reasonable and fair. Now, I said, we're not going to defeat the hackers. The hackers will always be able to break down whatever molecular design you have and all the algorithms. They'll be able to do that. But 99% of the American people are not hackers. And 98% of the American people, if you offer them a reasonable alternative to give them something that they clamor for, whether it's music or books or movies, and you offer it to them fairly and sensibly, they'll take it. It is that piece of the human condition that I'm banking the future on. Because I believe 98 to 99% of people in this country are honest and they care about their integrity. And therefore, we're going to offer them alternatives that I pray they will find beneficial to their own needs. So why don't we open this up a little bit? Uh, I'm going to place this microphone on that stand, uh, and I uh, encourage people to line up behind it for brief questions. <laughs> uh, for brief questions uh, in the time we have left, we'll take one at a time to start with. Uh, I don't think there's any priority if you're a defendant in an MPAA-sponsored suit. You just have to wait <laughs> in line like everybody else. And uh, we'll also alternate in the line uh, with questions that are coming through the question form uh, that the online viewers... Now, uh, why do I believe to... that as a result of these questions, I will not be universally beloved by anybody? Well, I, uh, each of you seems to have a thing about being hated. <laughs> I, I assure you, you're both very nice people. Uh, so let's... Uh, <laughs> Let's see what we can do. Hi. Um, my name is Manuel Goldstein from 2600 Magazine. I don't know if you know me, Mr. Yes. Valente. <laughs> but, MPA um, defendant, right? <laughs> All right, but you were... You, were you guys just won a big lawsuit against us. Uh, congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's, it's cost the Electronic Frontier Foundation about a million dollars so far. I know it's cost you guys about four million dollars. Uh, I know you tried to make us pay for that, but the judge didn't want to do that. My, my question, though, um, basically it revolves around conceptions, because while I lost the lawsuit, I, I don't think I've yet learned the lesson, because I thought I knew what a thief was. I thought a thief was someone who stole something with intent to steal something, um, but I learned that it's not necessarily that way, that a thief is actually somebody who writes software that can be used by somebody who wants to steal something. And then I learned that not only is the person who writes the software a thief, but somebody who calls attention to the software is also considered a thief. Uh, because at 2600, that's what we did. We, we had a website that pointed to the program or the source code that was used by someone to play a DVD on a Linux system, which was interpreted by the MPAA as thievery. Um, I'm just a little confused as to how far, how many, how many different uh, levels this can go to. With the help of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which I'd also like to know why I shouldn't be scared to death of this thing, it seems that any time somebody tries to figure out technology, they can be guilty of thievery if it's ruled that they shouldn't try to figure that out. I'd also like to know, I saw at the trial, I saw people outside the courtroom, literally across the street, selling videotapes of movies that had just come out that day. And we told MPAA people this, the lawyers on their side, we told the media this, and nobody cared. And those people are still there to this day. And somehow I'm a thief, so just clear up my confusion, please. Thank you. What was the question? <laughs> well, the, the, the question is, how is somebody who, who publishes information on a website about a computer program that shows how encryption has been hacked is a thief? Well, uh, I suggest you read Judge Kaplan's decision. Oh, I, I'm very familiar with it. <laughs> well, <laughs> if he was here, I'd be asking him the same question. But again, since most of it was word for word what you guys said, I'd like to know <laughs> the answer. You know what? The, the, it's the American judicial system at work. He looked at reverse engineering. He looked at security. He looked at fair use. He threw them all out the window. Said they had no bearing. They violated the DMCA. You cannot 
circumvent encryption. That's the law of the land. Now, if you want to change the law, you have to go to Congress to do it. Unable, I don't have a vote in Congress. Well, the DMCA did change the law, and that's the thing. Well, that's Con right. Congress voted on this with an unwritten vote, a voice vote, unanimous, everybody agrees but the that law you cannot circumvent encryption anymore. And I'd just like to know why it's so important to control how people use technology. Why is it important that uh, I not be able to skip over commercials on a DVD? Why is it important that in the future with HDTV that the same kind of controls be in place for recording programs and for playing back programs? I don't think a lot of people are aware of this yet, but that is what is going to happen. And the DMCA is what's going to make it possible. I'd just like to know what the intent behind this was. I mean, wasn't it good enough already before for you guys? I mean... Well, I'm glad you... I skip over commercials all the time. Well, you won't so be able nothing, to, and if you try, wrong, you'll be breaking the law. That. <laughs> that's my little controller. I'm saying again to you, no, no laws are lapidary. They're there to be changed or revised if the circumstances benefit the majority of the American people. So I'm saying if you have a quarrel with the DMCA... So, Jack, Jack, um, sorry, behind you. Uh, let me just ask to focus it a little bit. Um, you, you think have it's been a, unfocused, of course. Uh, do you, do I do, have, do too a personal view on the issue. Do you have a view on the issue? If Congress were to ask you, they're going to say, Jack, you tell us, what do you think? And we'll follow your lead. What advice would you render to the keep, Congress about Keep it? the DMCA in place. And if, they, and if they said why, what would you say? I would say it's in the long-term interest of the American people for copyright and the rights of authors, creative people, to make sure that their property is protected from the unauthorized use of that property. That's my simple answer. Well, I, I am an author, and I do create things. And in fact, I just made a film. And I've never had the desire to tell people where, when, how they can view my work and what will happen to them if they try to do something else. If you say I want my work to be offered to the world without compensation, may the Lord bless you. May Allah praise you. Go on. But Jack, wait, wait, there's a big dif difference between saying you should have the right to exercise perfect control over the use of the content and saying you should, be right, you should have a right to be paid. I, don't, I personally don't think that people ought to be able to get things for free in the sense of zero cost, not in, in Richard Stallman's view, not in the sense <coughs> of free beer. That's not what's important to me. What's important to me is free in the sense of free speech, in Stallman's words, free in the sense of being able to be used in any way that the person wants to use it. Now, I think the real thrust of the question, the excellent point of the question is this perversion of the language that's going on in this debate, to call this theft. I don't think you sort of brought the biggest part of it out. What happened in the DVD case? DVDs are, technolo are technologies that have a bit of code called CSS, that encrypts the DVD movie so that only on authorized players can you play it. DCSS is a bit of code that, that cracks that encryption system. To what end? It's not as if the objective or any evidence was offered that the people who were prosecuted in this case were taking DVD movies and, quote, pirating them. They weren't distributing anything illegally. What it did was make it possible for someone with a Linux computer to take the disk and put it in their computer and play it, a disk which they presumably bought. So where's the theft in that story? Where's the pirating in that story? What's happened is Washington speak has transformed people's ability to use copyrighted material in ways different from Hollywood's desire into what's so simple for everybody to understand the American way of protecting private property, but it isn't that. That's the point. It's not theft. It's about free use of the, uh, of the content. And what's the, what's the complaint that you have that somebody plays this on a Linux machine? Well, when you say Hollywood, let's understand what we're talking about. We're talking about 95,000 members of the Screen Actors Guild, 10,000 members of the Writers Guild, 9,000 <coughs> members of the Directors Guild. We're talking about all the people who work in the movie industry. There are many creative people, and they believe, and I think not without some reason, that their property, in which they make a living off of, ought not be devoured or used 
in a way that they don't approve of. It's their property. It's not property, Jack. I beg it's just not property. It's not property in, the, in any sense of what we ordinarily mean, and no justification exists for protecting it as you protect your well, car. Now, if you don't have a fair use right to use my car, that's right. You have no right to get into my car and drive it around the uh, block and say, oh, I'm just taking advantage of your car without my permission. That's what we talk about when we talk about property. Intellectual, quote, property is not that. The very same Constitution that gives Congress the power to set up, restricts Congress by saying, if Congress takes property, it must pay for the taking of the property. That's in the Constitution, the Fifth, Fifth Amendment. Amendment right? I know about it. The very same Constitution says Congress cannot create what you call intellectual property unless it guarantees that after a limited time it gets turned over to the public. The very same Constitution says you must turn it over to the public <laughs> for limited times. Now, in the, first, in the first 100 years of Congress's life, they changed the term of copyright once. And in the second 50 years, in the next 50 years, they changed it once again. In my lifetime, they've changed the term of copyright 11 times, under the limited times clause. Every time Mickey Mouse is about to fall into the public domain, magically, there's some excuse, the Europeans made us do it, for extending the term of copyright. Now, how is that consistent with this requirement? Well, if you let me answer you, I will. I'll give you two answers. Answer number one is the word limited. Now, what do you suppose that the founding fathers put on there? If they wanted to say 14 years, they would have said it, correct? Mm -hmm. They said limited. Now, we can say that depends on what the word is, is, but limited time could mean 90 years or it could be five years. Second, and I a think... A thousand we, years? Is that a limited well, time? I just pick a number. You're doing the yeah. same thing. You picked out 14. Well, I'll actually, pick you... The no, let, me, let, me, let me get my other answer to you. If you believe you're right, and you're a distinguished professor of law, and when I go to law school, I would like to have you teach me, why is it that every court that has confronted this issue takes issue with you? Only one has, and we're appealing their decision on Thursday. Well, I think there's several courts... <laughs> Listen, if some court, if the Ninth Circuit overturns Napster, so be it. Then we'll just have to figure out something else. But, Jack, but right now, every court that has examined this issue from all of its aspects has taken issue with you. In the, in, in the introduction of the Copyright Term Extension Act, the Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act, uh, Mary Bono, Congressman Bono, said that you had proposed a copyright term of forever minus a day. Is that limited times? Limited means a specific <laughs> amount of time. Uh -huh. And that's what the Congress has done, Larry. Uh -huh. Is that I a limited time, though? I beg your pardon? Is forever minus a day a limited time? I said earlier that I didn't think any law is lapidary. The Constitution has been, what, almost 27 times has been amended. And that's what this free and loving land does from but time to time. We haven't amended this part of the Constitution <laughs> yet. <laughs> no, so I want to know, is that a limited time? Well, I'm not, I'm not clear what you're saying. I want to get back to William of Aachen. I want you to keep that <laughs> simple. I think we should put the razors away, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then. Let's just uh, ask Ben to give us a question from the Internet. Ben, using your good judgment and your three screens, give us a question off the Internet from live. My Lord, you're trying to give us seizures. Uh, so... Curtis Priest says, if music is so central to culture, which I believe it is, why does it need to be so expensive? <laughs> After a certain level of compensation, aren't artists and producers compensated enough? Do they all need to live million-dollar lifestyles? The answer is, yes, we all need to li live million-dollar <laughs> lifestyles. <laughs> why not, for God? Him. This is America. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess since it's up here, why don't we just batch it with the second one, and then we'll go back to the mic. Uh, Kevin Bankston says, Professor Lessig, fair use has traditionally been treated by the courts as merely a First Amendment-derived defense against copyright infringement actions rather than as an affirmative First Amendment right. As privately deployed rights management, hardware and software, and restrictive licenses supersede copyright laws, 
as the primary way of protecting content, and copyright infringement actions become increasingly irrelevant, so will this defense. Will that be the end of fair use, or can you make some argument that it's a constitutional right rather than merely a defense to an infringement suit? I believe in something called the Cohen theorem, which is you have a First Amendment right to hack any system to guarantee access to protect fair use, which means, yes, I do believe it should be able to be used as an affirmative defense to guarantee a continued balance of protection in copyright. So these technologies you are talking about, which will reduce the scope of public access and public use that copyright has traditionally created, should be able to be resisted by people, and that resistance should be upheld by courts that would attempt to prosecute them for copyright infringement. Do you have any thoughts uh, on that? Or? I disagree. <laughs> <laughs> I'm shocked. Uh, Eric, you're up. My name is Eric Eldred. I uh, publish online books for free. Uh, Jack, uh, you seem to be a computer expert now. You can access my site at eldredgepress.org and read all these books for free. And I'm offering them and authorizing you to be able to do that. The books are generally in the public domain, but many of them are copyrighted because I secured the right to do that. And um, I also have permission from copyright owners in cases where, where perhaps uh, the books have been out of print and this is the only way for them to be accessible. But I don't want to talk about the case because uh, Larry Lessig is going to be arguing very eloquently in the appeals court for that this week. I do want to ask you something about the harmonization that you say was the purpose for the Copyright Term Extension Act, right? Harmonization of copyright law in the United States with that right. in Europe. Right. Well, in, in the 18th century, I mean the 19th century, I'm not too sure exactly when, um, two songwriters sat down at a cafe on the Champs-Élysées, I believe, and uh, they heard one of their songs being played by the orchestra. And so they called the manager over and uh, asked him uh, if if there was some reason why they were not paying for this, because they, if it were published in a sheet music, then they would have to pay for it. But if it were simply played by the orchestra, there was no law that, uh, that allowed the um, authors of the song to be reimbursed, right? Correct. So the, the manager um, refused to pay them for it because he said it wasn't required by the law. And so they refused to pay for their uh, meal. And uh, they were sent to jail, and the people were so outraged that the French uh, law then was changed so that the, there would be royalties paid for public performances of music. You agree with that? Is that stealing when, when that's actually performed in a, in a public place, uh, uh, music that somebody's written? Well, you're talking about ASCAP and BMI now. No, no, no. I, I'm saying, uh, it, uh, Charlie took you to a nice restaurant this evening, right? Uh, yeah, uh, yes or no? Uh, uh, no right, yes or no? I, okay. <laughs> Did you like the meal? I don't know enough about the contracts uh, at BMI. No, no, no. It's not, it's not that. It's the law, okay? In, in the United States, when the Copyright Term Extension Act was passed, it had a provision specifically uh, allowing uh, sm the owners of bars and restaurants not to have to pay royalties for the performance of music. Is that correct? You remember that? That was one of the provisions in the law. Without it, it would never have been passed. There was bargaining between the two economic interests. Is that correct? I remember there was a, a little oh, right. Pipe. Now, do you think that stealing, okay, if you're, if you're in a nice hey, listen, restaurant I, here in Cambridge... Am I on trial here? Is it stealing me? or not? <laughs> Tell me, what do you think? I want my lawyer to stand up and say I object. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, let's pretend, that, say? Let, let's pretend that you have some artistic talent no and that you're like Sonny Bono and that you could write a song and the song is being, you know, recorded and playing over the thing. I, I'm serious. I, I, the answer is you're talking about music and that's not my turf. You want to talk about movies, I'll be glad to do it with you. But, okay, suppose that instead of uh, movies, the law had exempted, I mean, instead of music, it had exempted movies from bars and restaurants from paying for movies. Would you think that that would be stealing? I wouldn't think anybody that tried to see a movie without paying for it or without having the, the permission of the owner is obviously doing something that's naughty. Right, even though the Copyright Term Extension Act you mean, it's in the public domain, domain, you mean? No. If the law says you can do it, is it stealing? If the law says you can do it, I'm not going to break the law. Right. Well, I, I, you know, I think next year, according to the New York Times today, you're going to be confronted with a bunch of artists who claim to be authors of the works. And they're going to say that they need to be recompensed 
according to the copyright law, for their works, all right? They're going to go on strike, and then the movie studios will, will have to defend their economic interests against the actual authors. If you remember back in the copyright clause itself, the limited rights were extended to who? Authors and inventors, right? All I'm saying is if it's against the law, shouldn't do it. If it's the law, we do do it. Right, but see, I mean, beyond the law, there's some principles involved, okay? You talked about Kant. You talked about, you know, the, this, this intellectual property theory of natural rights, okay? But there's, in Kant and in this natural rights theory, there's no provision for a limited term. It goes on forever. It's a perpetual right, all right? Is that what you're claiming? Well, you, when you talk, you're using the European version of the auteur theory, which is called well, droit morale, which is the moral rights, which we don't have in this country. Well, we have some of them, but is that what you want? No, I don't want the moral no, rights. No, because they, Eric, that, that only plays to the a chance to answer. Well, Eric, yeah. I mean, I'm not indicted yet, for God's sake. So <laughs> no. don't, don't, don't interrogate me like this. The answer is I'm opposed to the European system of what morale, or, uh, the, the uh, moral rights, because I think that's not consistent with what we in America do. And by the way, whatever the Europeans want to do, that is their sovereign right to do it. I have no problem with that. And we've got a sovereign right in this country to deal with it in a different way. We call it works for hire in the, uh, in the movie business. Period. End of paragraph. Okay. Uh, Larry, any, uh, any thought before we... Ben, do we have another uh, online comment you want to share, or should we go back to the microphone? Back to the microphone. Hi. I'm uh, Walter McDonough. I'm one of the uh, founding board members of the Future Music Coalition in Washington, D.C. And since you like precedent and you like Judge Patel uh, in her ruling the Napster case, I have to call your attention to a ruling the year before where, in a similar case to Emanuel, she ruled that there's actual free speech rights in, in source code. So different judges in the United States have differed on this issue. And I believe that, uh, thanks to Professor Nesson's work, the Second Circuit will overturn that case. And this is a point I want to make. I agree with you on a lot. I work in the entertainment industry myself and have for a long time. I love the business, as I'm sure you do. But there's a question I have to pose, and it's really more of an ethical, moral, and political question that is a legal question, and that is this. Can your efforts to enforce your rights have negative consequences for everybody else? I'll give you two specific examples. Judge Kaplan, in, in Emanuel's case, said, and, and I'm interpreting this, but my take on it is that he said that there's basically an, uh, an exception to the First Amendment in, in, um, in copyright infringement cases, which is something that our legal history completely rejects. The second thing that I think is very unfortunate and something we're going to fight uh, next year at the Congress, and probably going to fight with, maybe fight against you, I don't know. But traditionally in our country, we have always had a notion of fair use, whether it's for Harvard Law School or the elementary school down the street from my house. And with the proliferation of SDMI, the type of security devices you're going to have, you're going to try to circumvent the copyright code through technology so this traditional right that we've had for an entire history of Americans, we have for our teachers, for our kids, is going to be taken away. So the question I pose is, do you believe there can be detrimental aspects when you try to enforce your rights as a copy holder, and B, do you think that our traditional no notions of fear you should be violated for the benefit of the entertainment industry. I don't know of any detrimental effects that come from the protection of one's intellectual property. May I give you an example? I beg your pardon? May I give you an example? Of course you can. Well, I just it's spoke a free about... Country. Well, not if we have Judge Kaplan's case, <laughs> because he's saying that there's an exception to the First Amendment. I mean, clearly it's going to be overturned. Well, I think uh, Judge Oliver Wendell Holmes said there was an exception to the First Amendment. You can't yell fire in a crowded theater. He's not yelling fire. But this has nothing to do with free speech. That's what And by the way, on the DMCA, all the libraries in this country and all the universities in this country all signed off on the aspects of fair use within that DMCA. Are you aware of that? And I'm also aware right now that a lot of the librarians associations want to go back to the Congress and protect their rights against things like SDMI. I'm, I only know is the library association representing all the libraries in this country, and I might add uh, all the universities were deeply involved in the construction of the language, in the shape and form of the legislative uh, complexion of that bill, and everything that they wanted, they signed off on it, with Senator Hatch. I was there when they did it. Okay, well, they, they, they have a contrary position on this because they do not believe that the entertainment industry should be able to lock it up 
with a technological key and prevent them from bringing music or film into the classrooms as they've been able to do since the founding of our country. You can, in your classroom right now, show any movie you want. Go to Blockbuster and you can get any movie in the world except the ones actually playing in theaters. And by the way, every library, you can go and rent. I mean, uh, you can take out a DVD. You can take out a, 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 a video cassette. They're there in the library. It's anything you want, just except the movies that are actually showing in the theaters. But you mean the library can't wait for, say, one month or two months before it comes out in video or DVD form? Let me of course just, they can. Let, well, let's, 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 let me say one final thing. Five sure. years from now, as you're building the catalog and you lock it up with a technological key, that may not be the case in 15 well, years. Well, I'm not aware that we're doing any locking, but uh, maybe well, you... Maybe we can get narrow, narrow this disagreement a bit, Jack. I mean, I think the questions, the thrust of the question is, we've had a tradition protecting fair use. And you've, you agree, you support fair use, right? I, I absolutely do. Okay. Let's imagine it becomes the case that technology takes away fair use rights. Would you oppose that technology, technology takes away fair yeah, use? Yeah. I, I'm a, I'm, I am for fair use. Okay, so would you oppose? But it is the definition of fair use. Larry, I think that's the key here. Everything has to be defined, particularly in law. Mm -hmm. Right, so we could, we could have that boring law game of defining it particularly right now, but whatever it is, if technology reduces it, would you support, would you oppose that technology? I don't have any idea what you're talking about. Well, if you just give me an example, I'd be glad to answer it. Fine. Fair use is ordinarily understood to be the, uh, including the ability to take and copy a certain portion of a copyrighted work, regardless of the author's. Problem. To use in a classroom? For example. Absolutely. That's fair use, and if, I have no problem with that. Okay. Let's say as a technology makes it impossible for you to copy it and uh, expressly says that you're not allowed to use it except for the following use, to sit as a couch potato watching it at home. That's what it says. But you the license says no, and the technology no, makes not, it... No, that's not fair use to me. I, I know fair, that's not fair, fair use. Fair use is being able to show Spartacus or, or uh, Aaron Brockovich, which is a brand new movie, in your classroom if you want to talk about that. And by the way, if you want to show it in the library, it'll, that's fine too. You have it to be able for people to take out and take home and bring back to the library. Right. That's fair use. Right. But if the technology made it so that you could not exercise fair use, you could not copy a section of it, for example, which is ordinarily... I'm opposed to that. You're opposed to that yes, technology? Yes, I am. Okay. That's so, unauthorized, and that's the whole key to this thing. And I don't understand why the simple urgings of a simple sentence is not getting through, and that is, you cannot use a piece of intellectual property that you have not gotten permission to use or you haven't paid fair compensation for the use of it. Now, what is so ambiguous about that? So I, I want to start bringing our uh, session to a close. I thought it might be useful to uh, review the bidding as quickly as I've been able to tally it a little bit uh, as to where the axes of conflict have been. Uh, it seems that in... in one piece of it, uh, there is dispute as to what constitutes sometimes a legitimate use of intellectual property. Uh, there's been a clear dispute, for instance, on Napster as to whether what we all think to be the typical use for Napster, somebody finding an anonymous friend online and grabbing a song and keeping it, uh, playing it, that somebody somewhere along the line ripped, whether or not that constitutes fair use is clearly a dispute between uh, the two of you in most instances. Uh, derivative to that is a dispute over whether something like Napster itself is illegal because it enables people to do this. What I'm hearing uh, from you is that, you know, yeah, it's essentially a burglary tool. That was sort of the question from the defendant in the DECSS case. If you make a technology that can do it, you say the law prohibits it, and well, it should because it's enabling the theft of intellectual property. Larry, you have a very different view on that as to whether uh, the clockmaker should be uh, it all punished for uses to which the watch is put. And then the third, and perhaps to me at least the most interesting uh, dispute I've detected here, is on the limits of protection for what we're loosely calling intellectual property, particularly as those limits are advanced by technology. And that's kind of what the most recent colloquies have been about. Uh, the best hypothetical I can think of to kind of get at it is uh, if the, the fellow you want to hire in the next two weeks came in and he said, boy, have I got a system to show you and it's uh, a new internet distribution for movies by which 
Uh, you can show it to somebody on a given computer, but there's just no way, once it's on that computer, to transfer it to another one. And uh, the fellow says to you, in fact, if you think about it, uh, libraries, which can accumulate DVDs and then lend them out to their patrons, and presumably when somebody borrows it from the library, they need not buy it from the store. That's correct. Uh, right. Exactly, and that would be perfectly legal under copyright law. He says, but we can now make it so that someday DVDs will be stale and old-fashioned. We don't need to release movies on them. We'll just release them after the theater into this streaming format. And with it, we can see to it that the library has nothing to lend. Well, I, I'd be opposed to that. You'd be opposed to it. Of course. Great. I um, think the library ought to have it. <laughs> well, listen, I'm not an oracle. I'm not the Delphic oracle here that, uh, yeah. uh, that's coming down from Mount Olympus. I'm saying to you that I believe fair use is legitimate and that libraries and universities ought to have access to it under legitimate rules. That's all I'm saying. And under technologies that then would try to match That's those right. rules as close as possible. All I'm saying to you, I'll put it another way. Just because technology makes stealing easy doesn't make it right. Now, the very fact that something is up there and you've got some technical means to bring it down, it's like I get a, a magical skeleton key that allows me to open the front door of every home in my neighborhood. That's not right. And the corollary is, if the technology can give you a magic lock that locks out every single possible use, including the library, maybe that's the technology going too far as well. Well, I'm saying to you, let me go back again. I'm, how many times do I have to say it? I believe in fair use, right. which has nothing to do with technology. Uh -huh. Fair use. Right. See, Jack, this is... The most interesting thing about this debate to me is that I really misunderstood you. See, I've been going around saying, you know, all you guys that said Hollywood didn't get it, you were wrong. Hollywood gets it, right? Because they have passed this statute, the Anti-Circumvention Provision of Digital Millennium Copyright Act, and they've been developing these technologies, which will make it possible for them in five years to almost perfectly control distribution of content. They will not only have what copyright wanted to give them, the ability to make back money so that they have an incentive to produce, but the power to control. And I think if you listen to the questions and people who are in this industry, that's what they're afraid of most. A set of laws and technology that, that controls use. Now, from hearing you talk, what's striking is you, that's not the vision you have. Uh, you don't see a future where fair use is eliminated by technology. You don't see a future where people can't get access to what they want to get access to except under the terms that somebody else sets. Your future, in the way you see it, seems to be very much like the world was in 1950 with books, but now it happens to be on the Internet. If that's true, the only difference we have is uh, that my view is much more in line with what was expressed here about how much power the technology gives content holders to destroy traditional values that have been important to us, like fair use. When you add those technologies on with a tradition that expands the term of copyright now to 140 years, uh, that adds up to a very different vision of the possibility of culture to develop freely and openly, free in the sense of free speech. Now, I hope you're right, but I think you should hear in people who are actually touching this code and listening to this technology and seeing how their life is being regulated, you should hear the real fear that I think you would agree with. The fear that these technologies will destroy values that have been important to our tradition and that you defend, values like fair use. And I think even limited times, although you avoided that question quite artfully, and I congratulate you on that. <laughs> Let me say it again. I'm going to say it in C. Dick Run, C. Jane Run language. And that is this. I believe it is the right of an author to be able to protect what he has created or she has created, whether it's a poem or whether it's a novel or whether it's one of your books that the Random House is going to put out or a movie or whatever. You have a right to protect that. And the laws of this land say you have that right. So long as what you have is not used in an unauthorized way, then you can make it available to people. I hope on the internet, as I said, we'll do it with prices that are reasonable and fair that most people would find 
beneficial. But any time you use it in an unauthorized fashion, that's wrong. And by the way, the, the bewildering smokescreen that says we are, we are stopping and truncating innovation in technology is palpable nonsense. Well, that's a different debate. But tell me what you mean by authorized. But if I mean I, by what? Tell me what you mean by authorized. If I sell you my book and it says, you agree when buying this book never to criticize what I say in this book, uh, and you use the book and then you criticize it, are you violating my rights as an author? Well, if you made a contract with me and it's written down, I, Lawrence Lessig, pledge I'm never going to criticize this. I'm going to do nothing but laud it. And then you do the opposite. I would probably, I guess you teach contracts, don't you? Would no. that, would, wouldn't you violate the contract? I wouldn't see this as an enforceable contract, but I'm not in the majority on this view now. You, but well, I'm you asking said, you, you, is this fair orally. use? Well, I'd want it in a contract because, you yeah. see, that's the way I operate. I need a lawyer with me. Uh -huh. So here, I'll be your lawyer for a minute, Jack. And by the way, <laughs> I'd hire you, by the way, at $500 an hour, I think, would be a reasonable I'll, price. I'll give it to you for free right now. Uh, if the agreement says, by buying this book, you promise to give up your rights to fair use, do you think, and, and I, don't, I, 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 I mean, first, that's kind of a, a goofy kind of a question, I think. You mean, I say in my book that no, anybody who buys it can't criticize me? No, I'm well, saying. Well, it's crazy, uh, of course. I'll buy the book and I'll kick you in the butt from right. 20. <laughs> but now I shifted to fair use. Let's say you buy my book and it says, you agree not to use this book uh, in any way that is traditionally protected by fair use. You waive your fair use rights. Well, I, I, I have no idea what you're talking about, to be honest. Well, on that note, I feel <laughs> as if we've been here forever minus one day. So, uh, we've been here for a limited time. <laughs> it is a limited, limited. time. Limited. Uh, Becca Nesson, Ben Edelman, Rebecca Hardiman, John Palfrey, uh, Claire Prestel, Chris Babbitt, our folks at the chat table in the back, uh, all have worked mightily to make this thing. Uh, Oops, there it is. There's Jack Valenti's proposal for term to last forever less one day. Perhaps the committee can look at that next. I think those are the words of Mary Bono introducing the... Uh, yeah, Sonny, Sonny Bono. Bono. Yeah. The late Sonny Bono. Yes. A wonderful man, I might add. Yeah. I just have one question that, I mean, that I, has nothing to do with this debate. I am astonished beyond my comprehension that so many really bright people would sit here from 7 o'clock to 9 o'clock. Oh, what, what time it's is it? It's still 6.15, actually. But. <laughs> <laughs> that is a limited time. <laughs> I, I'm really amazed at that. I, I, I don't know what that signifies, to be honest, except maybe this is a lousy night to do anything in Harvard. I, I don't know. But I'm, I'm <laughs> stunned by it, and I'm, I, as a matter of fact, I'm rather joyful about it, though. So I just say that to you, or whatever the hell it means. Well, I think while Jack and Larry embrace, uh, please give us an outpouring of love and gratitude for their having put this together. Thank you, Thank you a lot. Larry. Thanks very much. Uh, we usually have a reception, but due to budget cuts, I think we just have us, so thanks.